last year at exactly uh, the same conference, um, we made an interview with uh, Zaha Hadid, and when uh, Steffi rang me and uh, suggested that we could maybe develop that as a series, I thought nothing could be more wonderful than here, do an interview with Taryn Simon uh, to talk about her work and particularly talk about her new exhibition and this extraordinary publication, A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters, which just has come up. It's really uh, uh, come out, it's an epic book uh, and we'll show images of that. Before starting, I just wanted to show you a few images from, uh, from London uh, because Steffi was also saying that it would be interesting to address the kind of question of the museum uh, and the art institution in the 21st century in an interdisciplinary kind of way, connecting it to, uh, to archive. And uh, um, all of Tarin's projects have to do with archives, so do our marathons, which are kind of non-stop events. Tarin has participated in our manifesto uh, marathon. Very often, these marathons uh, make not only a connection between art, literature, music, architecture, but also, ever increasingly, a connection to uh, technology. Here, for example, you see Aaron Koblin. It's last year's map marathon, where we actually felt that mapping is a great topic to bring the world of art, the world of technology, the world of literature, and all kinds of other worlds together, because maps play such a big role. They're a very big story on the internet, obviously, with navigation systems, but they have played a very, very big role in the art world uh, and a big role in, in literature. So through mapping, we tried to somehow bridge the gap, and Aaron Koblin showed here these permanently changing real-time digital maps, which were also shown, actually, at DLD. Can we have the next image, please? Here more Aaron Koblin. The next image, please. This year, and that opens, uh, it's actually a, a sort of a sneak preview, one can say, because this opens on, uh, um, on Friday uh, in London is our next pavilion. Uh, every year we have a pavilion. Uh, Julia Page <coughs> Jones, our director, has invented this idea of an annual architecture commission. Um, and Peter Zumto is the architect of this year's pavilion, the Swiss architect. He developed a pavilion which is a garden. He invited Pete Udolf to plant um, more than 1,200 different plants in the center of this space. It feels a bit like a cloister, like a monastery. It's a place of conversation and also a place for silence, as Zumto pointed out. Uh, and in this uh, uh, garden, we will actually continue with the marathons, with lots of uh, readings also, poetry readings, uh, all kinds of other things related to the garden. It will also connect, actually, to a project, Karolin Christoph Bagakiev, who is here, uh, Laurence Bosse and I have organized at Villa Medici, where 10 years ago we tried to build up at Villa Medici an archive of gardens. So an, again, this is not a project which has anything to do with objects. It's uh, an idea which actually has to do with, with archive and how an institution can build up an archive and the garden as a process and as an archive. The next image, please. Here you see the pavilion from outside. Many paths lead into this garden. It's really a hortus conclusus, uh, where you sort of leave the city and enter into this very, very peaceful zone uh, connecting to, um, to the plants. Next image, please. Here, a detail of the garden. Next image. And that's the future. Uh, the Serpentine uh, has a project next to uh, the Serpentine Gallery. It's a new building. Uh, it will be our extension, the Sacro Serpentine. Uh, it's more than a new wing, really, because it's a second building. Uh, we invited Zaha Hadid uh, to uh, uh, design an, uh, uh, an additional element to the building, and the building will be uh, restored, will be renovated, and this will be a laboratory. Uh, Julia Payton Jones and I will conceive of it as a pluridisciplinary laboratory uh, where we will try to reach all the disciplines. And obviously, we are a contemporary art institution, and as the visionary German museum director Alexander Dorner said, um, we can somehow only understand the process in, in a museum, in art, if we also look at other disciplines. And so, starting from the art, we will go into all kinds of other disciplines and develop this as an, experimental, uh, as an experimental zone. And this idea of experiment, this idea of archive, leads us right away uh, to Tarin Simon. Tarin has been present uh, three years ago at, um, uh, at DLD and introduced her, her projects there. So, today we are not going to talk about all her great previous uh, projects, the Innocence of 2003 to Contraband in 2010, Tarin always works in series. Um, all the projects are, are of a very serial nature, but today we're going to talk about the living man declared dead and other chapters. And this will be uh, 
different chapters in itself. The presentation has different chapters. Uh, it will be a presentation by Tarin of images from the exhibition and the book. It will be a Q&A because I will ask Tarin a few questions about it. Uh, and it will then end with a questionnaire, uh, somehow inspired by Bruce's uh, questionnaire. It's important also to say that there is, uh, in Germany, soon going to be the possibility to see these works because after the tape where the work is seen at the moment, uh, Tarin's uh, A Living Man declares that and other chapters will actually be developed into a site-specific uh, installation in Berlin in the National Gallery curated uh, by Udo Kittelmann who also edited this book. Tarin, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> so I have to apologize because I have a cough. We'll see how it goes with the microphone. But um, I'm going to... My slideshow up. One second. Okay. So uh, the project, this project that I'll be showing to you, is something that I produced over a four-year period, and I traveled around the world during that time, recording bloodlines and their related stories. And in each of the stories that I documented, there are 18 chapters, each one referencing a very specific narrative. Um, Thanks. The, um, you, you, what I was interested in is the way in which the external forces of power, religion, governance, and territory collide with, the, uh, with psychological and physical inheritance. And I was looking at ideas surrounding fate and, and whether it is determined by blood or circumstance. And <laughs> The stories that I actually document in the project are almost archetypal, ep archetypal episodes from the past that will occur again, that are occurring now, have occurred in the past, will occur again in the future, probably in different geographic locations. But in the way that blood is ordered and a bloodline is so carefully determined and ordered, I wanted to consider the idea that the stories themselves and all this chaos that surrounds us, and in this project you'll see quite a bit of violence, that <laughs> perhaps in some way that is ordered or patterned as well. So this collision of order and disorder really influenced the way in which I presented the work. I just wanted to, before I dive into the stories and showing you specific images, it's just good for you to see the installation of the work because it's kind of complicated in a slideshow version. But <coughs> this is at the Tate, and you can see the work is divided up into these multiple panels, and they're quite large pieces. Um, these are single panel works. And now I'll get into the specifics to actually describe to you what it is. So each work is comprised of three components. The first frame is where I systematically order the members of a bloodline. The second panel is where I, uh, I write the text for the narrative that I'm, that I'm investigating. And then the third panel, where you see more disorder, that's where I allow the environment to enter into the photographs. And <laughs> there's a bit more entropy and it's meant to kind of refer to how we engage with information and stories on the internet or in newspapers and ideas of forgetting and remembering and beginnings of new stories and how we construct history. So <laughs> ideas uh, surrounding the archive were certainly things that I was thinking of and this idea that in blood we keep, we keep being born and we keep dying and this cycle keeps moving and <laughs> considering to what end. Not that I have any answers, but I was interested in that sort of disorienting space. <coughs> Sorry. So this is chapter one, and now you're seeing them outside of frames. These are just the book layouts. But this is a, a bloodline in Uttar Pradesh, India. And the way in which it's ordered is how bloodlines are ordered in the study of disease, which I won't go into because we don't have enough time. But the man on the top left went to go to the local village registry to pay his taxes and found out that he was listed as dead. And he had been issued a death certificate. He no longer had any agency. His, and this was done 
to interrupt the hereditary transfer of land, allowing a cousin of his to seize his land. And his three other brothers who are in this bloodline were also listed as dead. So their land was taken away from them. They've been fighting to be recognized as living for several years, and every time they show up for, to have their case heard, uh, the judge never appears. So this is a, and as a photographer, to photograph these men who are supposedly dead, and a photograph being this great evidence of life that's used in hostage scenarios, and uh, <coughs> it had this kind of interesting irony, photographing these ghosts. And this is where, <laughs> where I got the title for the entire project, A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters. But in that, I was interested in the metaphor of us all being parts of the past and in a way the living dead ourselves as well. And there are empty portraits in every bloodline. And those empty portraits in the text panel are shown to correspond to different excuses throughout the world of why people couldn't be present for the shoot. So in this particular series, these empty portraits represent women who weren't allowed out of their home for religious or social reasons. Those are three women who weren't allowed out. And this is their cousin who in a separate case is also listed as dead. This is the uh, village registry where they're listed as dead and this is a, a photograph of them with their fingerprints asking to be reinstated as living. And this is a um, dead body floating on the Ganges which is where their father was laid to rest which kind of initiated this entire story. So those, <laughs> the ancillary images are also abstractions and kind of fragments of the larger story. And Karen, can you maybe say a few more things about these three topics <coughs> structure, which is very interesting. That's a decision you made at the very beginning that you basically decided there are these three elements. They're, they're almost like triptychs of uneven yeah. size. Yeah. There is a strict order on the left, and there is a text in the middle. And on the right-hand side, I mean, it's almost like a atlas. It reminded me almost of Avi Warburg. It's mm -hmm. kind of associative principles where mm -hmm. you connect images which are related, but they're not related to the bloodline. It mm -hmm. also is a different form of connection than mm -hmm. the bloodline. Can you tell us about these three? Well, that, that fragmentation is really meant to butt up against the order that's represented in the bloodline. And the bloodline is almost meant to look like a periodic table. And then you have the, di the disorder in the, with the other images. And the, <laughs> the text panel itself, which, you know, in reality, when you're looking on the wall, it's this pie and this narrow. And it is meant to kind of refer to the scroll but also this collecting of information, this anthropological representation, and how, how different power structures record the individuals that are living within their states. So that I have information collected on every single individual I photograph, date of birth, job, where they're living, and oftentimes in this one, for example, they don't even know their, their date of birth. So this particular story is about the body double of Uday Hussein, who is the second man in, and he, this is Latif Yahia, he was removed from his actual bloodline for several years in service to the Hussein family as Uday's body double. And they made rape threats against his sister, and um, he was tortured before agreeing to accept the position. <laughs> And he had to get plastic surgery to look more like Uday. He also had to wear lifts in his shoes to be the proper height. And in the footnote panel, I have, these are gold-plated, um, a sniper rifle and an AK-47 that are inscribed as a gift from Saddam Hussein to Uday. So I was interested in this idea of doubling, having a double life in one lifetime. And in the same way that the AK-47, this symbol of revolution, could also be a luxury item coated in gold. And here he is reenacting what he was taught to do as Uday, the salute, the wave, the smoking of the scar, medals for his service. This is chapter three, which is a very large piece. And this shows all of the children and grandchildren of the man on the left here, Andiho Jora, who is believed to cure AIDS, tuberculosis, evil spirits, mental illness. And he's often paid for his services in cash, uh, cows or goats, but <laughs> occasionally when his services can't be afforded, 
he's paid in women that are given him in ex in ex to him in exchange. And these are the all of his grandchildren and children from his nine wives. This is in um, outside of Kasumu in Kenya. And you can see this one includes quite a number of portraits. And here you can see the, the parents sitting behind the child, which creates these weird images of kind of a transfer of power and agency <laughs> when you get to sort of dig into the portraits. And then in the, in the landscape panel, in the, sorry, in the footnote panel of this, there you see the, a mother and child, and she's behind the child. And then there were um, several absences of uh, children who weren't allowed to come to the shoot because there was a fear that their father would kidnap them. So a woman who had left her husband. These are six of Undi Undihodora's nine wives. These are the, this is a cow, which he's often paid for um, with. These are cell phone towers that were erected on his land um, from which he receives great royalties and is very wealthy as a result compared to his surrounding neighbors. And the fact <laughs> that the cell phone company chose his land over others has become a symbol of his power as well. This, these are patients for evil spirits and for HIV. So this one is a bit more, um, well, I don't know. Anyway, this is three bloodlines, and you can see their space. This is one, two, and three. And in 1859, a very wealthy man introduced the European rabbit to Australia uh, for sporting purposes, and it had no natural predators. So <laughs> it started to eviscerate the landscape, and the government has since been trying to develop virulent diseases to kill off the rabbit population and control the damage. So these are rabbits that were bred in a government test in uh, Queensland, and they've all been infected with a lethal disease, and they're waiting to see if it will be effective and kill them. And by the end of the experiment, um, all of the rabbits died, except for a few which were euthanized. And then <laughs> I'm about to show you a photograph of uh, Rabbit Free Australia in collaboration with Hayes Chocolate uh, has stopped producing chocolate Easter bunnies and has since tried to replace the Easter bunny with the Easter bilby. So I was also inter interested in myth making and how these things get, how holidays even get established and changed. There, <laughs> there's the Easter bilby. This is a rabbit kill. These are the diseases that they keep developing. And, and it's also about the bloodline of disease itself because as the rabbits get more resistant, the diseases get more virulent and it keeps traveling and evolving and becoming more problematic. This one was um, more of a performance piece because I went to China and uh, the State Council Information Office, which controls all foreign media and sort of uh, <coughs> image production that goes on within China <coughs> by foreigners. <coughs> Sorry. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks. I've had this for a month. Um, so the State Council Information Office, which was also formerly the Department of Foreign Propaganda, I kept being met with, met with them in anything I was trying to produce in China. So finally I decided it would be more, more interesting to have them select the family that I would document. And I was essentially their puppet and went over to China. They selected a specific family from, a large family from Beijing. The office declined to give me any further reasoning for their choice. And then they also dictated what I photographed in the footnote panel, which is their media tower. And then, um, and you can see uh, this is one of the only countries where everybody showed up. And dressed very nicely as well. But it's fascinating because even if here the rule of the game is different, because actually here you didn't, you know, choose the, the different uh, individuals, and you didn't set up the rule of the game, but you kind of surrendered. One exactly. Can say. Still, the principle remains the same in terms of uh, the the blank, you know, empty 
uh, background and also um, actually the way they sit because they were always sitting on the same kind of box. I think it would be very interesting to hear a little bit more about these parameters which you said very thoroughly because I remember, I mean, throughout the year when you did this project, we very often spoke on, uh, on BlackBerry Messenger and you were mm -hmm. always traveling. I mean, you traveled literally, I think, 300 days a year or even more, mm -hmm. uh, very often even in dangerous situations to do these projects. And at the end of the day, one doesn't see actually much of the trips. You took that out, but it would be great to hear more about the research, the trips, mm -hmm. and how you de decided to frame it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a purposeful decision, this kind of erasure of background in the portraits that creates this environment of the non-place behind all of the individuals I documented. And that was also to create this even stage and also have the subjects themselves be participating in their own othering of a sort by stepping into an environment and kind of foreign environment through this this cream background and um, and allowed for me to create these patterns and codes and considerations of um, the possibility of everything being coded so uh, and you had these boxes you carry no I mean it was kind yes. of I'm very was very fascinated by this idea that you traveled with seven gigantic boxes on all these journeys, and it was really like a portable studio of some sort. I yeah. mean, if with your contraband project, you made JFK, the airport, your studio, here the world was your, your studio, and you, it was on the move. Yes, and uh, we traveled with an enormous amount of gear uh, to allow for it, of, again, to have the same representation in all areas. So um, this is the media tower in China that they had me photograph, and then when I left, I photographed the gift bag that they gave me upon my departure, which actually had an encyclopedia developed by the Department of Foreign Propaganda on China. I'm only gonna do two more and then we can. Uh, this is a orphanage in Ukraine and these are all the children living there. It's an orphanage for older children. So there are nearly um, no adoptions. When I was there, there was one adoption in a one year period. And many of the children are asked to leave the orphanage at age 16. And it's uh, reported that many of them are targeted by human traffickers and child pornographers and criminal activity for their survival. So this is, they, this is about the absence of a bloodline. And they were ordered by age as a result of not having any information about their past. And you can see where it slips in and out of accuracy as well, because many of them didn't know their, their age. So there's guessing along the way as well. And then I wanted to particularly keep this one very insular. So there's a lot of photographs of the interior of the orphanage and no sort of comment about the outer structures influencing it. I hope you'll get a chance to see it in person because these are hard when you have to digest them digitally and also outside of their grid form. This is the classroom at the orphanage, which when I got home, I had that sign translated and it says, those who do not have a past don't deserve a future. This is the boy's bedroom at the orphanage. This is the girl's bedroom a craft that one of the children had made of a stork delivering a child in the cafeteria. Should I keep going? Yeah, let's see more. The more we more? can see, the okay. better, yeah. So <laughs> this one was designed particularly to allow a viewer to have a direct view of the interruption of genocide upon one bloodline. So this, this particular panel shows a family that was, um, who were victims in the Srebrenica massacre in Bosnia. And so you can see on the left, I'll just try and describe it to you. I know it's minuscule here, but it's easier to describe it this way. On the left, you have the grandfather, then you have his daughter following him, and his four children follow, who were all killed in the Srebrenica massacre. And there are mortal remains and tooth and bone samples representing those individuals. So you have, for example, he is her father, that her name is Zumra. 
She lost her eldest child, who was just discovered in a mass grave when I arrived in Bosnia, so I was able to photograph the entire mor mortal remains. But then, <laughs> additionally, her, her next child was killed and had been discovered years earlier. All that remains, because they buried all of the mortal remains, is this slide of a tooth sample that was matched to DNA evidence collected from other family members. These are tooth and bone samples from her other two sons as well. Then this is Zumra's sister, who also lost her child, and his tooth sample is representing him. And this is the only piece where I actually visually represent the dead. Here's another child who was killed. And then these are personal effects awaiting identification from family members at the International Commission for Missing Persons. This is graffiti on the walls of the battery factory outside of which they were killed. And you can kind of see the sexualized violence. And here's video footage from the Milosevic trial which shows a Serbian scorpion unit being <laughs> blessed by an Orthodox priest before rounding up the boys and killing them. Should I do one more? Yeah, right there. Okay. So <laughs> these are two bloodlines, and they are the bloodlines of the two directors of the Tanzanian Albino Society. Their children, their children repeat in each of the bloodlines because they are actually married, whereas the other members of the bloodline change. But when I was saying earlier about fate, and is your fate determined by blood or by circumstance, those that are born with albinism have a very different life than their brothers and sisters who are born black. And <coughs> because albinos are hunted because their skin is believed to have magical powers and their organs are used in, in um, potions for the sick. Uh, hair is weaved into fishermen's nets so they'll catch more fish. Bones are buried into mines to get more diamonds and therefore there's limited access to education because they have to live in a very protected way. And this is a, a child who had had um, her arms cut off by a human poacher and was left to die. When I was in Tanzania, they had just started cutting off the hands of people who had the letter M imprinted in the palm of their hand because that too was believed to have magical powers. And not only are the albinos victims of human poachers, but also the sun itself is an enemy because many die of, at an early age of skin cancer. This is popularly called an albino bill because albinos are believed to bring great wealth and fortune. And this is a man applying for an emergency cell phone from the government, which is one of the programs they've put into place to help albinos in emergency situations. Maybe see one more, a last one. <laughs> okay, maybe, well this one is about uh, the uh, Druze family in Lebanon. It's actually a very surreal piece. And as you can see, it follows a repeating pattern. So in the ordering of the bloodline, one of the individuals in this actual bloodline is in my text panel given two birth dates. He's both born in the 1800s and in the 1900s. The Druze believe in reincarnation. It's one of the foundations of their belief. And he is believed to be both his father's father and his father's son. So every time you arrive at him in the bloodline, it repeats again and again and again until the end where I allow him to just be himself. So this kind of became this surreal illustration of what I was talking about earlier, about this insistent return and how, how we're all part of the past and part of the future but this is people who actually have memories and beliefs of being a part of the past. And the Druze don't accept converts because it's believed that every Druze was formerly a Druze. So this, in the book as well, creates this almost nauseating ry rhythm of repetition. And then the bloodline finishes off as it normally would. I photographed people reenacting their deaths in a former life from their past life memories, and Wali Jumblat, the Druze uh, political leader, and Sheikh Naim Hassan, the Druze spiritual leader. And this that leads us to the book, yeah. or can we see one more? Um, <laughs> th this is about um, Arthur Rupin, who is the 
was sent over by the Zionist organization to Palestine in the early 1900s hundreds, to investigate land settlement opportunities for Jewish settlement. And I wanted to see, did the family remain in Israel? Did, what were the migratory patterns of the family? And more importantly, I also w went to the uh, Jerusalem archives in, sorry, the Zionist archives in Jerusalem. Let me just get through this. There's, um, that young man was in army service in Gaza when I photographed him. That's another part of the, the project. It looks like I photographed everybody in one place and had a nice easy, easy sitting with everyone. But when you read the textual information, oftentimes there's five countries in one piece that I'm going to. So this is an advertisement for the Jewish national home. This is an early land purchase receipt with Ottoman stamps. This is Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence was signed for Israel. And these are actually very interesting. They are the early reports uh, when the Zionist organization was considering British East Africa as the potential site for Jewish settlement and their population density maps and considerations of the land if it was suitable for inhabiting, which is to consider if Israel were in Africa. And this is the card index catalog of the earliest immigrants to Palestine. So all of these works will be seen in the site-specific installation in Berlin, which we hope you can now see. And of course, there is also the book. And I mean, the book is at least as important, one can say, as the exhibition. It's a, uh, a parallel reality. It's an extraordinary text introduction by, by Homi Baba, but works really like, a, like an artist book. And you've been super involved in the design. Can you maybe tell us about the book? How it was? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was quite complicated to see this in book form in, and in slideshow form, to be honest, because I really had always imagined this project as almost creating tables at the Smithsonian in the way that, that uh, historic events are recorded with the, the jewelry and the letters and the photographs and all the materials collected from surrounding a certain event and collecting all the information and kind of making it into these tables. And I thought about that in a, in a photographic form and then putting those tables up on the wall. Uh, but in book form, it just, it gets more at that idea that I was talking about, that machine-like repetition, because it's just this relentless return of these individuals, one after another. And by photographing on this plain background and both highlighting the individual, but then through the mass of it, the individual is somewhat erased. So it's that conflict between, you know, what we are and how important we are. And it also reads like a really epic polyphonic novel with so many characters of repetition and, and, uh, and difference. I was wondering, I mean, the epiphany to this project, how do you invent such a project? Because very often, I mean, you always work in these series and the series become more and more complex and uh, it takes you years to, to accomplish such a project. Um, and I always sort of think you, you actually start already at the beginning with a very clear idea. You don't find it on the way. You mm -hmm. define the categories and then you find it in reality. Um, how, for example, came this idea about? What, do you remember the day when you had the idea, the epiphany? Well, I've always, in the past, I've always been uh, cataloging things and making them feel comprehensive, but they inherently weren't. It was myself putting it in a book with a spine and it has the, the appearance of something complete. And I started thinking about what, what would be absolute? What is something that I can't curate or edit where there is no choice? And that's when I arrived at blood. But then I wanted to combine that with the chaos of the stories that surround um, people's lives and kind of have those two things butt up against each other. So that was, it came from a conceptual place and then I went and each one has a really specific reason for inclusion and I would go and sometimes imagine the idea and find its real life application or, um, or start with reality, usually just the idea. And one of the things which is both in the piece but also in the book very present is the text-image uh, relationship. It was interesting because this morning we went on the way from the airport here, we went to, to a bookshop because I have this ritual that I need to buy a book every day and so we needed to go and buy a book and you also bought a book. Mm -hmm. uh, you bought this extraordinary book of, uh, of Thomas Schütte, these mm -hmm. Detri notes which are watercolors of Thomas Schütte with text uh, and images. And in the, in the car we discussed this sort of text-image relationship which also Homi Baba addresses. Now in the introduction which very often in your works 
kind of in your work plays a role of these opposites which mm -hmm. somehow touch each other. Can we talk about text and image and how yeah. it relates? I mean, what I'm most interested in is the space that I can't create. So what you're missing here is I spend an enormous amount of time on the writing of these stories. And that's a huge part of the book and the exhibition, but I'm kind of narrating this really uh, diminished version of them. But what I like, what, what interests me is that space of translation between text and image. So not just in art, but even in the newspaper and how we, how we, um, how we, how we remember events and how translation occurs across languages and how information is conveyed and forgotten and how an image can be completely imagined in one form and then transformed by the text that accompanies it and that space between where um, interpretation and translation occur and, uh, and often disorientation. So. And one other thing which maybe is interesting to talk about because we spoke about the book, and uh, the book for me is like, a, is like an epic novel, but there is also always a link to, to narratives, there is, a link, there is a link to cinema. And Szeslaw Milos, the uh, Polish poet, Nobel Prize winner, when we went to interview him, he was almost 100 years old in, in Krakow, uh, he told us that he thinks nobody in the 20th century has not been influenced by cinema. Mm -hmm. A photographer, any visual artist, a poet, Mm -hmm. uh, an architect, a scientist, he, he thinks cinema has had an influence on all of them. And very often in our conversation, cinema plays a big role. You've also worked with Brian De Palma very directly mm -hmm. by intervening in one of his films. And in this book, again, there are very many sort of cinematographic narrative moments. Can you talk a little bit about this whole connection to, mm -hmm. uh, to cinema and this demand for narrative? Right. Well, the, th the thing in this which actually confronts cinema and is using what photography does and cinema does not is photography freezes time and takes something out of the continuum of time, literally. And in this project, I'm photographing these bloodlines that are ever-changing. They are cinematic. They keep rolling. And uh, people are dying and being born. But the, ph the photograph is able to isolate this moment and take it out of that continuum. So <laughs> in, this pro in this project, it's functioning in that way. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but you also have um, sort of the cast of characters associated with a specific narrative, and then you have this other panel that introduces the environment and scene and settings of the narrative at stake. So it's all these ways of storytelling. And it's also like a manual somehow of, uh, of survival. And I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very violent project. There's a lot of violence in this project. I kept thinking of Charles Agamben, uh, uh, and his sort of whole notion of, uh, of bare life. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and that leads us maybe to part three of this okay. presentation here, which would be our ongoing questionnaire, which we do each time when we do interviews. And we must say that this is part of a whole evolutive interview, <coughs> which has the working title, Around the World with Ty and Simon. It's the eighth <laughs> interview now we're recording. And each time it ends with the questionnaire. And this whole idea of, um, of violence and, and, and suffering, which is in the book, leads me to the first question of what is your dream of happiness? Uh, my dream of happiness would be um, to never die. What role does chance play? Chance, I tr well, in my work, or in my, in my work, chance, I always try and build everything and establish everything in such a calculated form but inevitably it all falls apart. So chance is always a part of my work. And when is photography art? I, I no longer understand what photography is or what art is. I feel like everything at the moment is so interdisciplinary. So it's, I mean, I kind of hope I don't do either. Then a very strange question, which Hans-Peter Fellmann answered with an image. Brauchen wir Löcher? Do we need holes? And you see here Hans-Peter Feldmann's answer. <laughs> what would be your answer? Do we need holes? <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'm off while I think about that one. Uh, do we need holes? Well, we need holes to uh, carry on and procreate. And <laughs> we need... Um, we need, well, my work is about sort of black holes or the, the space of sort of spaces with no answers and spaces with no conclusion. 
So equations that equal infinity and not necessarily a determined uh, number. And how do you relax? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Which picture accompanies you at the place you work? I have, um, I have one photograph on the wall, which is actually of my grandfather's family, which l it led me very much to pursuing this project, but it's of, um, they were, uh, they escaped Belarus, and there's a photograph of them all. It's a very large family. One thing we haven't talked about ever, actually, in the interviews is your sketches. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about this and if you create many portraits or, or self-portraits. I have private sketches. You'll have to come over and tell me how <laughs> bad they are. <laughs> <laughs> and is there somebody you always wanted to photograph? Kim Jong-il. In North Korea. Do you have dreams? I have, yes, every night. <laughs> Lots of nightmares. Then, Doris Lessing the other day, when we talked about her unrealized project, she says there's not only things we haven't been able to do, but there is also self-censorship. Does self-censorship exist? Sadly, yes. I mean, I think on, in, a, in a public space and in a private space, I, I, I don't know that I've met anyone that is entirely uncensored mm -hmm. and sober. And do, do politics and art mingle? Do politics and art mingle? Um, again, it's hard to know what po the word politic even means and art. And so, yes, there is visual material with political contents, but um, and there are teams that are very opposed to that and those that are interested in it, but it's all, I feel like everything, there are no envelopes anymore. Everything is very much um, intermingled. How would you like to die? Uh, there is no form of death that I would like. <laughs> and last but not least, the very last question. As a child, you wanted to be like? Uh, oy. As a child, I wanted to be like, well, I wanted, I wanted to uh, be a um, scientist and out in the woods and um, I, was, I was a hippie child, so. Great, thank you so much, Tarin. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.